Hey everyone, it's Carter and welcome to Making It Up. So as you know, a show where uh, I just talk to writers of all sorts of backgrounds and uh, genres and we just sit and have a good chat and at the end we make up a quick story together. Um, today I talked to Joe Clifford, who is one tatted up dude. Uh, I, I, I met Joe a few years ago or several years ago probably at a, at a writer's conference and I was just immediately compelled by him because mostly, you know, you see the big arms of the tattoos. So that's one thing, but he's just a guy who just says <laughs> what's on his mind and he doesn't care. And it's totally uh, just refreshing. And you'll see evidence of that in our conversation today. So Joe writes just wonderfully gritty noir novels. Uh, and his last book, Rag and Bone, was an ITW uh, Thriller Award finalist, which is a big deal. His upcoming book, The Shadow People, launches in July of 2021 and looks fucking great. Um, so I'm looking forward to reading that for sure. He's got a really interesting past. A lot of it's pretty dark. Um, and so we dig into that uh, pretty deeply in this conversation. And then true to form, when we make up a story, uh, it gets noirish very quickly. So this is me and Joe Clifford having a conversation. Enjoy. There it is. All right, here we go. You just see How are you? Here. Yeah, you look beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I got Jackson, the little one's home, and he's not, uh, he just had surgery, his tonsils out, so he's oh, being a little difficult about uh, what he wanted to eat. And how how old? He's uh, six. Oh, so how many, how many kids you have? That I know of? That you know of? <laughs> Two. So six and? Six and ten. Okay. I mean, he'll be six next month. But yeah. And they're, they're homeschooling and getting their tonsils out. Well, Jack has a, a autoimmune disease called PAFTA, which is uh, it's not as serious as it sounds when you say autoimmune, but it's he basically gets fevers every month, so like high fevers, like 105. And Jeez. one of the um, possible cures is to get your tonsils out, even though it's not tonsillitis. So huh. we finally did it because it was just getting so annoying. Like you can give him steroids and it's just. So what are the yeah. odds that that's going to work, that that's going to be the end? Pretty good. They're oh. actually pretty good. The odds are very good. That's that's why we did it. Um, what a weird thing. 80% success rate. I don't understand how it's not tonsillitis. I had tonsillitis as a kid. <laughs> like, yeah. but now they call it different things and whatever. So, uh, well, should have luck with that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <But he's, laughs> he does not like taking medicine. And no. uh, there's it it a fight. It's been a fight for two weeks. And uh, and it's just, uh, let's just hope it's over soon. We get yeah. medicine. Because it's annoying. All right. So you're 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 right. in o Oakland, is that right? Oh, sweet. Okay. Are you it's, from from California? No, Connecticut. If I say quarter, you can say, oh yeah. Oh uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I hear it. My quarter. So you you grew up in Connecticut? Yeah. I don't know if I ever grew up. My wife was just telling me the other day how immature I still am, but I mean, she's not wrong. <laughs> And who's the barometer for whether or not you're immature? Like, <laughs> you, you can't really judge yourself very well. That's got to be somebody else who has to be able to tell you that. Yeah. Well, I'm not. I mean, and I know I'm not mature. So that tells you, like, uh, it tells you how bad it is. Uh, but I don't know. I never really had the, the desire to, to, to mature. It seemed huh. like a lot of The P Peter Pan syndrome. Well, you know, growing up means growing old. And that means dying and dying to me. doesn't sound like all that much fun. Is a yeah, great I, John. Good I think I've heard that before somewhere <laughs> so when did you uh i mean i know you a little bit but i don't know yeah. you that well and i'm so when did you as you're growing up in connecticut when did you start or did you have some kind of inclination towards writing or towards creativity or was that a, a latent thing in your life <clears throat> well no creativity i mean i was an artist from from the get-go i mean i knew that and i can see the instruments behind you so you're obviously yeah I mean, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I've always unless those that's my, just for show. No, those are my paintings as, as well. As my, oh, okay. Um, so yes, you're I paint, play music. I write all the all the things. The crows have eyes. Three. <laughs> I just, uh, <laughs> my daughter gave me that. Oh, I love that show. God, <laughs> oh, I was so in love with Alexis. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, just, just uh, yeah. God. Okay. Anyway, um, so yeah, artist. Um, 
well, you know, can't can't pay attention. Flighty headspace, <laughs> a sort of that's part of the deal. Depth disorder. Um, yeah, no, I've uh, I've always done the art and done uh, you know painting and music and drawing and all those things that don't earn you a paycheck. Is that right. is that from your family? No, no, no. In fact, that's that's to great to the great detriment. My mother, of course, she was wonderful. She you know she encouraged me to do that you know because she everything I did was wonderful. My father was much more of a uh, you know man's man, steak potatoes, work in the trenches, yeah. get up early, stay late, you know that kind of thing. Uh, and he did not have much uh, much use for an artsy son, uh, you know, who was pretty sure he was gay. I mean, that was my dad's thing was that I was gay, and he made that very clear early on, and he didn't like that. So. Uh, huh. Uh, that always kind of hung overhead. There was a lot, there was definitely this, uh, well, I mean, I guess that they call it to toxic masculinity now, <laughs> but uh, yeah. the idea that I was creative and I didn't, um, you know, I was a slight kid. I was, you know, sensitive and all those things that my father equated with uh, less than a man, I guess. Uh, huh. So it was never, never encouraged uh, from his end. Uh, later on, I think when he found out that, uh, yeah, I, I was, you know, indeed just a regular guy who was going to, in his eyes, regular guy uh, who's just going to be an artist. It, it wasn't quite as offensive to him, but uh, huh. yeah. It's Are they strange. still around your parents? No, no, they're dead. My mom died. They both died in 2004. Uh, oh, and, uh, same yeah. year. Wow. Yeah, same year. They were divorced. And divided, they were, they died the same, like six months to the day of each other. Kind of how, how old were you when they got divorced? First time they got divorced. Oh. Uh, I was seven, I think, and the second time I was 15. Okay. Yeah. So, and then so you yeah. sounds like you were a lot closer with your mom, but she wasn't necessarily a, a creative influence. Well, I mean, to be fair, my mother was a wonderful person. My father was a fucking prick. So, yeah, I was a lot closer. With mom. Two ends of the spectrum. Huh? <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not sure that's you know, how it even works. You know, you get older and it's, we tend to compartmentalize, right? And we, we, we conveniently define things as easier, right? So, yeah. I'm sure my mother wasn't quite as wonderful as I recall. My father wasn't quite as bad as I recall. Uh, but yeah, um, I was close with my mom and then, but you know, I, I lost touch with both of them when I, when I, when I had the drug problem and I had only recently come back from that, and, uh, you know, gotten back in school and started straightening things out and, uh, reconnecting with, with, well, I mean, I always stayed in contact with her, but I just started reconnecting with my father and then he passed. So, um, so where, so, so you went to school out in Connecticut where did, and you went to, to college after that? Well, I was a hobo, so I went. Uh, I went to school in Connecticut. Read too much Kerouac. Went west, San Francisco. Had the drug problem. Bounced around. A lot of drifting to. So Arizona. how old are you at this point? I'm like 23. Okay. Like you know, I, I started working. I had a job for a few years and a uh, good paying job and everything. It just was like this. This isn't what I do. You know. I'm an artist, so uh, I started being a hobo, traveling around, and then got into drugs or got into drugs and started traveling. It's a little murky. <laughs> I wrote a whole book about so, it. So hobo yeah. being the polite euphemism for you were homeless. Yeah, I was homeless. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So my friend Tom Pitts and I called me hobos. It's a nice, uh, it's a nice sounding word. It's, it's romantic. No, yeah. I said so. I went to Jumping Arizona. On trains. Yeah, and I went to and I got married to another uh, schizophrenic junkie wonderful wonderful woman uh outside of those two qualities she was really just terrific but um <laughs> she's insane uh and I, mean, I was insane it was just a crazy time it was uh you know so in vermont and massachusetts and you know i was committed to some mental hospitals and that whole my oh, 20s wow. were um, spent uh figuring out how to survive i guess being different would be the easiest way to say it so i didn't fit into what you need to do in this world to survive i just couldn't do it i couldn't i couldn't i couldn't work a day job i couldn't pay my bills i couldn't come home i just couldn't do those things i, I and, and it seems like what do you mean you couldn't do them i just couldn't i, I, I yeah it was, it was you know it was like a square trying to be a circle i just, I just couldn't do it but is there you know knowing that you couldn't do those things and knowing that you were different was that a was that some kind of pain that was alleviated by the drugs. Like where did the drugs fit in? Like did the drugs just help that. Yeah, I, mean, I think the drugs, uh, you know, you know, they start out like, uh, you know, cause I didn't drink, I didn't touch anything. You know, my family's really a little alcoholic. So I didn't, I didn't do any of that stuff until I was 21. I went from 21, have my first taste of beer to being a 
addicted to heroin and meth by, by 22. I mean, I was like, um, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think what happens is, uh, you know, the, the drugs come as advertised. I mean, they, you know, this idea that drugs don't work is, is one of the, you know, the bigger, more detrimental lies that it does more harm to people because, you know, people like, I was, you know, the first time I did did drugs, it was like, well, I'm not, I'm not homeless. I'm not strung out. I'm not robbing people. I'm not my dog Shira. She, she wants to go out now. Hold on one second. Yeah. Here you go. Here you go. Here you go. Here you go. Get out of here. Um, I'm sorry, she got a crazy Pomeranian. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no. So, so I did the drugs, and 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 and, and for a while there, it uh, it really did make everything better. Um, you know, I didn't feel the pain. I didn't feel the hurt. I had to focus, you know, because I'm a little, was a little, uh, and, um, and I wasn't sad all the time, you know, I wasn't feeling this great weight pressing down on me where I felt like I wanted to die. Mm. And of course the proper drugs is that, you know, after a while they stop working and then the drug becomes the problem. Um, but yeah, so, you know, if drugs didn't work, you wouldn't have a million people doing them. Like they, they work, <laughs> right, the problems right. they work until they don't. And then when they don't work, you are screwed because right. you're now, you know, yeah, there's no false advertising. You, sh- you know what you're getting into or you should know. Yeah. Well, you know, it's just saying, you know, I, you know, you probably grew up like I did with the just say no and, and crack is whack and all these yeah. things. I mean, I mean, I grew up in a small suburban lily white town. And so, uh, you know, just the way even, you know, marijuana was presented, I guess what I'm saying is if for me personally, if, if I had been ex- explained, <laughs> Not that this is anybody else's fault. My drug problem is not anybody else's fault. Uh, but if I if I had maybe had a more realistic idea of what drugs were, as opposed to this like you know boogeyman hiding in the corner, um, it, it, you know, versus reality, uh, maybe I don't take the deep dive yeah. like I did. Uh, well, it's it's so funny, like the decisions you you make and and who you hang out with. I, I always feel like so when I was in high school, I grew up in L.A. and when I was in high school, you know. For my first couple of years, I hung out with some kids who were not so great. And then I kind of gravitated to this other group of really smart kids who were much smarter than me and funny. And they were just good kids and they ended up being my friends. And I'm like, oh, thank God I ended up hanging out with these kids because you never know which direction you're going to go and how influenced you are and how that really changes your entire life. And you don't realize it at the time. Well, there's so many, so when you're coming of age, there's so many, you know, being a dad now and trying to think about how, I got, <laughs> yeah. how right. How you got to, I don't know what I'm going to do at 15 when my kid's 15 or six. Like how, how do you explain how this world works? And nobody, nobody could have sat me down and said like, this is how it, because there's not any just one bad path or one wrong direction or one thing you need to know. It's, it's all these nuances and, you know, tangents that, build off of this and build off of that. And it's this wonderful, you know, accident that sort of happens that, that turns into your life. And, and some people are okay. Yeah. <laughs> some aren't. Now, 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 that's for the, that's for the kind of people who yeah. are, I mean, I, I'm talking about, I mean, I'll use the broad term artists or different or, or, you know, because there's a lot of people who just simply can go to school, can get their job and move on and live their right. life without, and then there's others of us, and I'll include you in there because artists seem to all share the same weird, and that seems to be the idea of the podcast, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. We have this, it's just not, there's not a, there's not a direct, uh, you know, to become an artist, you know, there's not, you don't just apply for a job, like from being an artist, you got to somehow find a way to make it work and make money at it. And it's never, you know, like people used to always be like, well, you like to draw and you like to, you're creative. Why don't you go to advertising? Because I, like, I don't want to fucking go to advertising. <laughs> what the fuck do I want to go to advertising? Like, I don't want to right. fucking, like, like, what about me? Do you think I want to advertise to make this person, like uh, capitalism and all that? Like, so, um, but that's practical. I understand why they did that because it's like, that's a practical way to go. Right. There you go. You can be creative in advertising. You can make your money. You have your health insurance. You, you know, you're secure. And it was just like, no, I don't want to know. I don't want to wear yeah. fucking pants. I, I don't want to. So, so you're in your twenties yeah. and you're, and you're strung out and is there a bottom? Oh my God. Yeah. There's a bottom. That's the nice thing about bottom is when you get there, you just keep digging. Uh, there's, there was quite a few bottoms. I mean, the, the, the real end of it came, uh, uh, you know, it was sometime in uh, 2001 or two or, and I was back in upstate New York and, and there was a failed suicide attempt and, this is all detailed much more clearly in my novel, Junkie Love, which you can <laughs> pick up at fine retailers everywhere. Uh, it's just, it's hard to explain. It was, it was three days that was just 
absolutely nuts. Was, I was still married to that, the woman I was talking. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I had a girlfriend I met in rehab. So my wife and I weren't together. And, and, and she left me, the, the girlfriend and the wife. It was just a fucking, just a, just a fucking mess. I mean, I was a mess. You know, I was, you know, 150 pounds soaking wet. Uh, wow. Just a, just a mess. You know, taking buses. I had no shoes. I kept getting arrested. They kept letting me go because, you know, middle class white kid. Still yeah. middle class white kid, so they let yeah. you go. And yeah. uh, it wasn't doing me any favors. Um, and I get committed and I get out and I, did, you know, it's, it's just... It was just a shit show. And so, yeah. and, but you came, so you stopped, but you stopped. Like you, there was a moment. Well, yeah, fast forward. <laughs> Spoiler alert, <laughs> I survived. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, something, you know, the moment hits where, where, where you, you do say, holy shit, I, I have a drug problem. And I know that sounds really, it's going to sound really trite to people like, well, if you didn't have shoes and you were sleeping outside and eating out of dumpsters, didn't it dawn on you had drug problem? No, it really didn't. Like it, yeah. it's, it's always everything else. It's all everybody else's problem. Everybody else's fault. Everybody else has made me this. You know, it's this weird thing where it's it's us versus them, and they're they're the reason. And no, it's not. You're the reason. And and and, yeah. and, and, it, and then when it hits you like that, it really does. You know, in AA, they call it the uh, you know the moment of uh, I don't know. I don't do AA. I'll be honest. <laughs> but yeah. it's like uh, uh, the epiphany. But it's like moment of clarity. You know, yeah, yeah. and it hits you and you go like, oh, wow. Okay. And, but yeah, it did hit like that. And I, uh, I, I was like, okay, let's, but, let's come but back. That's that moment of clarity and be able to act upon it. It's pretty impressive when you consider it doesn't sound like you were surrounded by a lot of people who were trying to help you out, you know, and. No, and yes. And no, I mean, you know, we also, I mean, it's a nice story, you know, and, and, and you know, I, I give myself credit for because a lot of people don't come back from that. You know, my yeah. brother, he had the same, my brother also, you know, middle-class white kid who didn't come back. I mean, addiction ended up killing him a couple of years ago. So uh, everybody doesn't make it out alive. But at the same time, I also had a lot of tools a lot of people don't have. I, I, I was able to go and talk to my mom and, and be like, hey, can you help me out? And, and we got me into a decent rehab. Like I was able to stay, you know, six months. Although by the end, I, my decent rehab options were, were kind of gone. I was, I was pretty much inner city rehab. But um, yeah. I still had options, you know. Some yeah. were still going to bring me a carton of cigarettes if I asked. Yeah, um, yeah. And so and I, it's hard to give myself credit for digging myself out of a hole I dug myself into. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, well, like you I said, mean, it was that, my... Yeah, a lot I mean, of people I, don't make it out alive, so. Sure, but I mean, you, you fuck up bad enough. It's like, you know, I don't know. It's like kidnapping yourself and then like negotiating your own ransom release. Like, all right, I, I, I guess. Yeah, but it's about consequences, right? Like if you're you're not losing a job because you don't even have a job. So it's not like that's a consequence. It's literally like you have to, you have to bring it upon yourself to say, I don't want this because, you know, there's no other, there's nothing you're really losing otherwise because you don't no. have anything. All right. Well, here's the real, the real crux is like, as we sit here now and, I'll, and I'll, I'm sitting here with you going like, well, you know, if you get, gets that bad, you just stop doing the drugs and get, you know, you get yourself back. You know, that's how a lot of people looked at it. And, um, but when you're at that point, you're not who you are right now. You, your thinking has been so twisted yeah. and you have just become so perverted in your own, being that, that that you don't have the resources and 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 the wherewithal um to use the tools you have now right so you're yeah. thinking it's this is this strange you're you're a fucking mess when you you know living that way you're you know it's, it's a combination of years and just you know not even having proper nutrition and you right. know, your skin's falling apart and the way people you know people look at you and the way you look at people and so it's it, you're it's so warped that yeah that that's the part that's really amazing is that um, there was enough of me in there that could still sort of um, negotiate my release. So coming out the other side of it, you're still that person, even though you're clean, you're still that person who can't hold down the job or doesn't want to hold down a job, doesn't want to go into advertising. So you're still faced with like, all right, how do I make practical application of all these different artistic talents I have? And, and you probably have to lean towards one of them or one or two of them. I, I don't know if you're, you know, if you're as prolific a writer as you are a musician or a painter. No, no, that's exactly what, that's exactly how it happened. I, uh, I, uh, you know, they, they, where I went to, to rehab was a long-term facility where I finally was like, just don't let me out for six months. And they give you an option. You can get a job or go back to school. And, uh, and I was like, all right, let's go back to school. Cause I fucking, I'm not getting a job. I'm still, I'm still <laughs> that. like, that's just, not, you're I really remember, determined not I, to have a job. I, I, I remember that. that. 
Yeah, I remember that. So I went back to school <laughs> and I went back to school. They had a program for uh, specifically designed for people to, to re-enter society through the Bureau of uh, Rehabilitation Services in Connecticut. And uh, it turned out that the school I'd gone to and dropped out of, uh, some of my credits were still left. And, um, you know, it was like, like I, I was like within a month of them not being valid anymore. Like it just all worked out. It was all serendipitous. So they took me back to uh, Central Connecticut State University. And when I was there, um, some of the, a lot of the professors, uh, uh, Steve Ostrowski and Dave Capel and Tom Azuka, Marianne Nunn, all, you know, wonderful, great writers and people. And they took me under their wing and sort of, um, you know, put me on a path that uh, let me become a writer. It seemed like that's, you know, when you're talking about like, you got to pick one direction. Um, yeah, I was like, well, writing, you know, I'll make concessions. So I probably won't be able to be a novelist because who gets to do that? But I'll uh, at least get the rights, which is, yeah. I guess, my version of compromising towards advertising. And So uh, did you start with short fiction then? No, I started with poetry. Uh, okay. No. I don't there's there's a huge market in that. They can, <laughs> well, I know a lot of people have just retired off their poetry royalties. Yeah, I know. But no, the funny thing is poetry, so, I, you know, and I'm so, I'm so gun shy. I mean, like, I mean, right now, like, I'm, I'm 225. So, you know, I'm like, that, that weight means something to me because I was like, back then, I was like 150 pounds. That's like, yeah. Like yeah, third of when I, you know, so I was skinny and skittish. And Steve Ostrowski tells a story when I was sitting in this class. I used to, you know, I was the first, in the front row, just shaking, like literally shaking. I was like, this, I don't know how this guy's going to make it because I haven't been <laughs> part of society in 10 years. Um, so I, I, I wrote, but I wasn't very confident in my writing. And I, I'd written a poem uh, about that first wife uh, and uh, in poetry class for Ravi Shankar, not the Ravi Shankar, apparently that's the name's like John Smith over there. Oh. Uh, Ravi Shankar, different Ravi Shankar, wonderful, wonderful poet great guy uh and he was like you should enter this in a contest and i'm like i can't enter it. like and so he actually entered my poem into the connecticut review a contest hmm. i got picked up i got paid like 500 bucks to, to tour around wow. the state it got printed in the magazine but i remember robbie saying to me hope you like that because that's about as much money as you're gonna make in writing. <laughs> I mean, that's and impressive i thought it was a joke but you know it was a good 10 years before i i, I made that much money again um wow. yeah but then that from that uh you know i then i you know, some short stories. I started working for the literary magazine. I, uh, you know, and then when school's coming up, like I'm graduating, because I took all those credits, even though they were valid, I still want another four years. I ended up amassing like eight, eight years worth of worth of undergrad credits because I just didn't want to stop going to school. I loved it. Yeah. You know, it was, it was my, uh, I knew that if I, if I, you know, if I just stayed there, I would stay off the drugs. Yeah. I mean, I might, I mean, it wasn't quite that smooth a shot, but I just knew like, that's the path. You stay on yeah. that, you will get out of that. Yeah. Um, it, you know, and it's never quite as easy as you wake up like, oh, I'm stuck doing drugs. No, you stop doing drugs. I mean, there's you fall, you, you relapse. It, it's, it's a brutal process. But yeah, I knew that that's, that's the road. And if I stay on it and I just keep going, um, there's the light. So at the end of the, the uh, you know, all my, uh, all my time as an undergrad, I was like 34 at that point, something like that. Um, you know, what do you do next? And then I heard about MFA programs. And I was like, yeah, like, no, and they'll, some pay you. And I'm like, fuck yeah, let's do that. <laughs> so I got down to uh, uh, Florida International and uh, they paid me and they paid my tuition and they pay you money because they want to attract the outside talent, which was great. And I met a wonderful bunch of teachers there, Les Standiford, Lynn Barrett, and John Dufresne, and Dan Wakefield, uh, you know, who used to hang out with Kerouac. Although I think Kerouac kind of threw throw it. Kerouac threatened to throw Dan Wakefield through a window because Dan gave him a bad review, which is another story. But um, so I went to Florida International and, uh, and they happened to be a, um, one of the few schools that promote genre. Most MFAs, genres, uh, you know, as you know, it's a dirty right. word, right? Uh, and then I was still playing around the great American novel. You know, I mean, I named my first kid Holden and you know, <laughs> I, I yeah. fucking yeah. love the book. I don't care. I just, I, I <laughs> just reread that. Yeah, I, I, I will. I'll, I mean, that's the hill I'll die, die on, man. That's that's yeah. the fucking greatest book ever written. And I know that makes me like, I like Bruce Springsteen, the New York Yankees, and Catcher in the Rye, which is the most <laughs> cliched, uh, you know, uh, wait, okay. something 50 year old, but whatever. I fucking yeah. love the book. It's yeah. a fucking great book. So, um, yeah, I, I, I was going to write one of those novels, meandering, you know, guy in New York, uh, slight version of himself kind of thing. Um, but uh, they were, they were like, you should write noir because your writing sounds very noir. And I was like, really? Because that's what I read. Because <laughs> mostly I read noir. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, Lynn Bear was like, yeah, that's how it works. She fucking, you know, 
you read mostly noir, you're going to sound noir because as much as I love catching the ride, most, most of the stuff I read was, you know, Chandler and Hammond, yeah. all yeah. those guys. Yeah. So, and, then, and then you have these novels that are noirish, but they cross over into what, you know, thrillers or mystery. I mean, it's all, it's all a blur, yeah. right? Yeah. I, I write the, the, the coveted literary thriller genre. Which yeah. Is, <laughs> I was just joking with David Corbett on Twitter, you know, uh, you know, mysteries geared toward academics, you know, all three of them. Um, so uh, yeah, it's a very small market, but yeah, it's, it's what you do and, and, and it's what I do. So yeah. And, uh, it, and so what, go ahead. I was just no, going to say, when did, when did you start? So you're in school for a long time. And, yeah. and fortunately, the school's being paid for. But at some point, you got to get out and you got to like sell your yeah. work. So what was what was that process like? What, where did you first start to make money writing? Because I, I, I don't, I don't want to, you know, I, I'm honest to a fault. And, you know, being, being a thieving junkie coming from that background, like it sounds weird to say that, but I really, I, I don't like this idea of talking and having writers out there listen and go like, oh, wow, that's that worked out great for him. Uh, oh, no, oh, no, I make no pretense that any of us no, are no, making good, hand over fist happened, like, money. It was, it was the most fucking crooked cross. I mean, you couldn't cop, what I did couldn't be duplicated. Like I basically <laughs> fucked up my whole life. I came back to school. I took out a shit ton of student loans. I mean, I was taking out fucking student, like they were giving me money to live and I was still taking out huge loans because I just want, I like, like, but what you give me more money for a grad loan? You give me like another hundred thousand? No intent, no way to pay any of this money fucking money back. Like I just, I'm just taking money. I'm living, I'm living on the beach in a Hollywood condo in, in Florida, and uh, and I'm, I'm, yeah, and I think I'm gonna sell a book. But like, if you now know, this is a fucking terrible, terrible idea. It doesn't happen. But while I'm in, while I am in grad school, I have a motorcycle that I used the last bit of my mom's life insurance uh, money to get uh, because I wanted a fucking motorcycle. Uh, we talked about maturity and uh, I got hit by a bus. I hit by a bus and they gave me a bunch of money. So hmm. all my how long ago paid, was that? 2006. And wow. so, yeah, all my, all my loans paid off and uh, got me a house and, uh, and I get to write and, and I make money from writing, but yeah, without that, without that big old fucking blessed event that, you know, I'm, in two weeks I have to go for an ablation. You know what that is? That's I've really, heard uh, of it. Yeah. So, cause my back is so fucked up from that accident. They, uh, basically you know you get the spinal tap and then they they fry your nerves in your back and have to do this constantly like you know i woke up this morning walking the dog with a cane like i mean, I mean I'm, the pain is a shitty deal the pain yeah. from the motorcycle accident is a bad deal uh i have traumatic arthritis i got a bunch of screws in my hip uh i have constant pet patches and pills and, and, and physical therapy and it fucking sucks but i would make that deal any day <laughs> I, I'd, I'd right, the faustian deal. bargain yeah. yeah, I do it. I mean, I wouldn't, so, be, I wouldn't survive otherwise. So when, 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 when you're being interviewed and somebody asks you what advice you would give to aspiring writers, you tell them get hit by a bus. <laughs> yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> they usually don't explain it and they always just laugh. But right. uh, you know, it, it came about organically in our conversation. And, uh, and uh, so I was like, all right, here we go. Uh, you know, I, I have a few, you know, my speech pattern is still a little uh, disrupted from the drugs. As you can tell, I get a little a little fast and it's a little stuttery um my body's all fucked up from from you know the motorcycle accident uh but yeah here i am uh, 50 and, I, and 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 i get published and i write books and i make some money from writing books yeah. and that's yeah. my job so we're, we're the same age yeah i turned 50 last year um yeah, sorry about that yeah it's okay i yeah i'm, I'm totally okay with it yeah um, I mean, you don't want to wake up 14 times take a piss in the middle of the night it's great <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's awesome so you know, it's interesting because a lot of writers don't talk about the business side of it. And to me, it's fascinating because I came and I, I still have a full-time job, you know, because I can't support myself totally by writing, but I, I come from a very deep business background. So I'm fascinated by, you know, uh, the profit and loss statements of, of writers and, and just how, how the business works. So I've always been yeah, you know, lost. By, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> mostly lost. And, and, and there's not a lot of talk about how, like, you know, you hear the cliche of like, don't quit your day job, but it's fucking true. It's like, you know, I, when I first started my, when I started writing my first novel at the age of 33, I didn't know at all what I was doing. Cause I didn't go to school for writing. I just happened to start writing and I didn't tell anybody cause I was embarrassed by it. And I, and I didn't want to be the guy who like stopped writing it. And then everybody would ask me about that novel. 
And I had <laughs> no idea that, you know, or I had some idea that there was no <laughs> real path in them. Like maybe I can just publish a book. That would be cool. But I never thought like, I'm going to quit because I'm going to dedicate my life to this. And I don't know when that happens to somebody, uh, you know, what, wh how much you have to make to get to that point of like, okay, now I can, I can do this full time because it's, it's pretty brutal. There's about seven people who can do that. Stephen yeah. King, J.K. Rowling, uh, a few people we know, mutual uh, people who have nice big book deals and, and some friends who've come through recently. Uh, and, and, and I hope that they get the same opportunity, but for the most part, uh, it's, it's just a fortuitous sort of, Good luck. Yeah, buy, buy a lottery ticket. Good yeah. luck. My wife's a business major, uh, but again, you know, if I, you know, she loves me dearly and she's a wonderful woman, and, and, and I'm sure she'll say this isn't true. But you know, if I don't get hit by the fucking bus, I don't have any money. I don't have yeah. any money. I'm not attracting somebody of that caliber because she's in a different class than I am. Yeah. And so now I now she can help me with the business end of it, and she's wonderful. And we have kids and all this, but like all these things are, are possible because of some weird like and it all started back when i made the decision to to move west and there's a lot of bad decisions that turned out to be have good results so it's really hard you know my old high school brought me back to to speak to an assembly about about the dangers of drugs um and it was really tough to go up there because you know I mean, what, am, what am i really saying like my fucking life is awesome I mean, you know, outside of having to walk on stage with a cane, like, right. not that big a deal. They also give me medic meds, uh, you know, that, you know, the same fucking meds I was not allowed before. Now they have to give me because my body's all fucked up. Um, and, and so I'm going to talk to these kids and I'm trying to tell them, like, not to do drugs. But at the same time, what I'm really saying is, all right, well, maybe do drugs, but just, just don't become a writer. Just stop before <laughs> drugs. Because, and then, then you, you know, you're trying to, cause they can sniff through bullshit. I mean, that's the whole point of catcher in the rise. It was like, it's like, you know, 16 year olds fucking know the world's full of shit and it's, yeah. and they're not wrong. They're not wrong. Just you get older and you kind of go, ah, I guess that's just the way it's going to be. But you have that clarity of vision when you're, when you're 16, where you see the way the world should be versus the way the world is. And that's where the teen X comes from. When yeah. You recognize everybody you trust and love has been lying to you all along because it's not what's on the outside that matters and doing your best doesn't mean shit. Well, wow. you know, some people get lucky and some people don't and some things work and sometimes it won't and justice is not blind and all this fucking, all these platitudes they hand us, uh, you know, I was just reading about, which I'm sure you saw that the girl that stole the fucking laptop from Nancy Pelosi was just being released into her mother's custody and then they're comparing it to the kid that stole the backpack the black kid that stole the backpack and was locked up in rikers for three years and you just you realize yeah it's, it's the world isn't fair and that was the that's the big you know people was like what did you learn from your drugs life isn't fair that was the that was a big uh, that was a big lesson <laughs> right and drugs work until they don't yeah yeah until they don't yep um so when you write now yeah i know you're primarily a novelist but are you are you writing for yourself and hoping that they're going to sell? How much of this luck plays into what you've seen in the, in the, in the industry? Uh, well, I mean, now I'm talking about the business end of it and, and, yeah. and people always, you always get questions, you know, like what's the best bit of writing advice you get? And what's the worst bit of writing advice? The worst bit of writing advice I've ever gotten. And, uh, and, uh, and people continue to uh, push it is, is to write for yourself. Um, and it's just so disingenuous. Uh, <laughs> That's um, why. I love writing it for myself. Like, <laughs> right, it sounds right, but if you want to write for yourself, yeah, you, you know, have fun writing your, your, your journal, right? Like you're writing for a fucking audience. If you're doing this professionally, you can't write for yourself. That that, that day's gone. So to, to this idea that you can just write what you want to write, and if it sells, that's wonderful. And you always and you always get these big big authors saying like, "I don't worry about audience. I write for myself." You're like, fuck you. You don't fucking do that. <laughs> that's totally what fuck, I say. <laughs> you don't fucking do that. You have to write for an audience because if you don't write for an audience. Like you have an editor, you have an agent, you have a market, you have, and you can sure. write, you can be true to who you are. Like you can't, if you're inauthentic, right? Uh, that's gonna be the first thing they sniff out. If you're inauthentic, first thing that gets sniffed out is like you're a phony, like they, nobody's gonna, so obviously you have to be like, so that's understood, that's said. Like you're writing, you're being true, you're being authentic, but you have to consider audience. You have to consider genre. You have to consider, there's rules within what we do, right? You, so you can write, um, you know, I love, I love Kurt Vonnegut, right? But if I fuse Kurt Vonnegut with, <laughs> with, with, with Chandler, 
as much as I love that, and I did it in my first book, Wake the Undertaker, which sold six copies, um, it doesn't work because right. readers have an expectation of what every genre has to deliver certain. So you have to hear to those rules. Um, well, you also have the, the issue of, oh, I published, you know, now four, five, six, seven novels. Now I have an audience. Now I have expectations of me as, as an author. And then, it, you know, because I'll, I'll be writing and, and I, I like to say I do write for myself because I, I find that I am my best audience. But, you know, because when I start that chapter and I don't know what I'm doing, I'm like, this is just something I'd want to read or something I'd want to watch on TV. And of course, it's yeah, going to totally. be dark yeah. and the thriller. Um, but as I'm writing, I know like, okay, Anna, my editor, oh, she's going to fucking hate this part. So I got to be aware of that. And I might go through a first draft and have a lot of stuff in there that's just fun for me. And then it goes from like, all right, I got to take that's the shit out. One. Then yeah. draft two, go through and take out all that fun stuff. I mean, that's I mean, where that it all is. You know, right. I this this thing that's coming out next year, you know, it's an alcoholic who starts to lose his mind. And I had so much fun in the scenes where he's losing his mind. And then, you know, my editor's like, yeah, we, we need to cut down some of that. That's like, yeah. it's great. But I'm like, it's just because I had so, and I'm like, oh, you're totally right. You know, so. It's always the stuff we love the most that they make us get rid of, uh, yeah. which is which is just another trick. Kill your darlings. I have that tattooed Kill on my darlings. arm, actually. But the trade-off, you know, whenever one of my buddies is a companion complaining about being a writer, and I do it too, is, you know, we just send each other pictures of a coal miner. <laughs> so it's, it's, right. It gets worse, right? right. Just right. a coal miner with a black face, you know, just like, right. uh, yeah, so right. no. It, but yeah, it, it's, there. yeah, I, the last thing I did, Lake House, which I really, really loved, and it was something I, I, I kind of had broken away from from doing the kind of the, the mopey man in the mountain stuff, smoky, uh, smoky boy in the cold months is one of my... <laughs> fans, kids calls it, the Jay Porter books. Uh, and I was trying to do this domestic psychological thriller, but more focused on character and, and the points of view and, and small town nuance. And, and I, I blended too many genres, I think. I, I did yeah. two things and it really upset some people. And, and a lot of the reviews I got, I got some reviews, people love it, but a lot of reviews are sort of like very middle, like just, huh? like they, it just didn't, it didn't come across. And I, I think if I maybe adhered to a few more staples of genre, um, you know, pacing and, and maybe that kind of stuff. Like, but I, yeah, that was a book where I wrote a little bit too much for me, and uh, and, and and I think it affected the reception. Um, I'm also extremely sensitive, and I, I think the book's done fine. I've had you know decent reviews, and I think it's selling fine, and all that. But it feels to me like I I I, I missed something there. Um, yeah. And so but isn't that isn't that one of the best things about writing, especially as you get older? It's unlike so many other jobs, it's it's something that you always have something to look forward to. Like you could be 70 and then you might have a breakout. Maybe that's, that sounds yeah, depressing. Yeah, yeah. But no, I no, like no, the no. idea that the best is always potentially yet to come. 100 percent Totally. Like that the, the, you you always have that chance at any point today, either one of us could get that call. We're not gonna get the call, right? But we could get the call. Right. We but, could but, get the call. But you're also, and you're also doing it because you love it, right? Because it's not like you're doing some shitty job that you're just hoping for a payout 10 years from now. Like, I love the idea of like starting something new. I'm like, all right, I'm going to do this differently, or I'm going to attack it in a different way. And I'm going to really get into this person's mind. And, you know, it's just that goal is always there. And that's, that's only because I enjoy doing it. I can't say that about a lot of different things in my life. It, it, you know, it's, it's hard when you cultivate a persona you know uh, God, my, my head goes in 60 by fucking 10,000 directions to go in to answer your question so I gotta try to answer it quickly um and obviously I don't do that very well because I have this fucking mental problem but it's kind of like how Tom Waits created a, a persona of like the the vagabond right that guy and then he became that character like Johnny Depp you know uh, parts of the Caribbean now he can't give an interview where he doesn't sound like Jack Sparrow so I don't know if I'm as miserable as I, as I pretend to be yeah. Or, or I've just been doing this so long that I'm really unhappy because I always joke that like writing is, you know, my least favorite profession, profession besides all the others. But um, I think I actually do like writing. I think I really do enjoy um, being, you, you get in that zone and it's, it's the closest I've found to those old drug days where you, you get high and play music for hours on end. Like you can just yeah. you get coffee and you sit down and you get, and you get in there and you get the word and it, it starts flowing. You get in that world and that time time melts um, it is. and I can spend, it, it's like where did 12 hours go? Uh, which is a great thing for somebody who isn't that thrilled of being alive. You know, it's like, there's 12 more hours gone. See, I'm not even sure I mean that, but maybe I do, I'm not sure. But um, yeah, I, I love I love that uh, part of it. And I love that you always get to reinvent yourself and you get to try, but you know, it, 
with the lake after the lake house didn't do what I wanted, you know, I, I, I was able to take audience, audience feedback or reception or whatever, and kind of come back and do something a little bit different. Um, but yeah, it's all, you know, that's still content, you know, it's still contingent, uh, you know, on, on audience on reception. So I still don't think you can say you do it. We're going back to 15 minutes ago when you said you write for you. I still don't think <laughs> you can say you write just for you. <laughs> Are you ready to tell a story? Uh, what about what? We're, well, we're going to make up a story together. Okay, let's go. So, so I'm going to ask you a few questions and it's going to lead to me picking a book from behind me and then okay. we're going to pick out a sentence from there. So, so give me a number from one to three. Jesus. This, All right, this isn't hard. This isn't hard. <laughs> I got to go with three. All right. So now one to seven. Six. Okay. One to 20. 17. We're almost there. One to 100. 23. Oh. And, and uh, one to three again. Three. All right. So that determines the book that I'm about to go right. pick out. I'll be right back. I'll tell you right now, if it's Pride and Prejudice, I'm leaving. If it's Pride and Prejudice, I'm leaving. I'm not doing it. It's actually Hemingway. All right. So you pick The Sun Also Rises. Oh, and we're going, to, we're going to page uh, 23. And so I'm going to read the sentence, the third okay. sentence. And then okay. you tell me a sentence from there and we'll craft a five minute story. It can be, it can be whatever okay. we want it to be. Ready? Sure. Yeah. Don't talk like a fool. Talk like a man. I didn't like the way she looked at me when she said that. Her eyes squinted. They're usually so wide and bright. I'm feeling a little sleepy. I'm thinking it's time we get out of the bar. You'll just be back here tomorrow night. Why don't we stay for one more drink? I knew if I didn't get home and see my wife soon, I was looking at another divorce. But I didn't want to leave her alone either. These kind of nights were too rare. I reached over and brushed the knuckles of her left hand. Her skin was so warm, I wanted to feel more of it. I knew the next five minutes was going to make a large turning point in my life. When she led me by the hand, we walked through the back door. I was feeling conflicted. Part of me, of course, regretting what I was about to do to my wife. And the other part, thrilled that I was feeling these feelings again. A part of me that I thought had been dead for so long. It's funny how the excitement of the erotic is like a drug. How it gets into your bloodstream and just flushes you making everything else disappear, making you just want to chase the only thing that's right in front of you, making you forget everything else. When the back door opened and I felt the blow to the back of my head, I knew I'd been caught. You got to stop fucking around with other people's wives, he said. All those times, all those women, all these years, I knew there would be that one time and it never happened until now. I collapsed to the ground my head throbbing, and I looked up to him. You couldn't have least it waited till we were done, I said. She looked down at me, and she was still squinting, almost smirking, as if she knew that this was going to happen. She looked over to her husband, said, he's not even good enough for me. Yeah, where, where have I heard that before? <laughs> How do we end this? I think where have I, where have I heard that before? would be a uh, nice, be a nice, spot. Right. nice. <laughs> that was beautiful. That, that took a nice dark turn. Well, so, it generally does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, two, two guys are writing about crime and mystery, mystery and murder. And, and, and uh, it's, it's not going to end with sunflowers and uh, picnic by the, by the beach. I, yeah. I, I, I'm working on something new and I told my agent that it's not really a thriller. And then about a month later, I emailed her, my God, it's taken a decidedly dark turn. So it might be a thriller now. <laughs> So. It always is. It's just, it's how we're wired. I don't know. Some people look at the world and see, you know, rainbows and unicorns and that sort of thing. That's, that's not what we do. Otherwise yeah. we wouldn't be writing this stuff. I, li I liked, I like the conflict of it all. So, yeah. well, listen, man, Hey, it was great talking to you. I know you've got to yeah. run to, uh, you've got, you've got to, you know, spend all that, 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 that bus money spend know, it on the golf course. <laughs> the bus money. Oh. Yeah. It, it was great to talk to you. Yeah, you do. All um, right, man.
do it again. I'm sure we'll see each other in person one of these one of these days. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Thank yeah, you. Bye. Bye. So that was Joe. Interesting, right? Uh, I really enjoy talking to him. He's a cool dude, and I'm looking forward to hopefully seeing him in person in the not too distant future. Uh, if you want to find out more about Joe, you can go visit him at joeclifford.com. If you want to find out more about me or subscribe to my newsletter, which uh, Nelson Mandela once called the most original writing since the Greeks, uh, you can go to carterwilson.com. So that's it for this episode. Stay tuned. Come back. Keep clicking. There will be more soon. Thanks. Thanks.